So welcome back to Seekistan. Today what we have for you is a little look at some of our favorite podcasts we've ever recorded. A lot of people are kind of newer viewers to the channel in the last few months. We haven't been putting up as many podcasts, but as many of you will know, this whole Seekistan thing started off because of the Seekistan podcast, you know. So what I've done today is we've picked out some of our favorite guests. We've been honored over the years to have unbelievably successful athletes and Olympians. We've had their coaches on. We've had big names from sports and strength and conditioning on the podcast. So today we picked some of the funnier stories or some of the more hard-hitting stories from the Seeker Trend podcast. And I hope you enjoy these. This should serve as a nice little reminder if you wanted to go back and listen to any of these. All the links will be in the comments below. As always, enjoy. Let us know your thoughts below. Today's video is brought to you by Sika Bench. This is our bench press specific program, as you might have guessed from the name. What it is, is it's eight weeks of bench press specific training. It starts off with a frequency of twice per week. This then increases to a frequency of three times per week in the latter half of the program. People make phenomenal progress on this. So as I said, if you're a power lifter, if you're a weightlifter, if you're an athlete in your off season, if you're just somebody who goes to the gym and wants a bigger bench press, this is perfect for you. I was actually talking to him about you know mental strength and whatever, and he and I said to him like, "What do you do when it starts burning, man? Like, you know, it's painful. Like you, you can't push anymore." And Barry said, and Barry's like, like, "He's a hard man. Like that bloke is, he's been through some tough stuff." And he, he basically said, "Just." Don't worry about it. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going. Yeah. I think our generation, man, I think our generation is, is soft. I don't know. We're getting softer. Um, but basically, man, like uh, I came to Australia when I was 10, you know, came from a civil war in Yugoslavia. So, you know, all of my upbringing, I uh, hear stories of like, you know, very, very bad experiences from people. And so I've always kind of thought to myself, man, you know, what have we got to worry about, man? You know, like, you're running, you're running up a hill, you've got a bit of, you know, <laughs> burning in your legs or whatever, but you're well fed, you've got shelter and all that stuff. So I kind of always kind of had the exposure of hearing other people's kind of bad stories and, and experiences. And I always think, especially working in ED, man, like you see, man, you see all sorts of stuff, man. You see real struggle, you know? Um, and that kind of always reminds me every day. You know, I've been working there for 11 years. And so you think, oh man, I've had a really bad, Leg day, I did 10 by 10 at 60%. Oh, man, I'm, I'm so sore. Then you watch some guys go on their limbs, you know. You know, it's all perspective. It's all mental. It's all it's all that. Um, so I think that my career has had a lot of impact to me and my mentality of, of what, what's of what's perceived as hard. Because, you know, um, you know, pain is, 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 is a subjective thing, right? What you think might be painful, somebody else is like, yeah, that's cool. I'll live with that every day, you know. Um, so it's all about how your perspective and what, what, you, what you think about on a daily basis. Like if you're thinking about what's happening in the world and you know, Middle East and some of these third world countries, then you're like, man, I, like, I've got nothing to complain about. So I always kind of try and kind of zoom out and, and look at the bigger picture. So I kind of work harder in whatever I'm kind of doing. Shane, I, I just as you mentioned it there, you have some of the best teenager or middle school lifts we've ever seen you were an absolute beast of a teenager was that from playing sports or, or were you just kind of naturally very strong or how did it come about a little bit um from sports but i never played football or any like contact sports my parents just didn't want me to and i just i just sort of listened to them even though later on i did regret that a little bit um but no i was involved in i did swimming very young gymnastics I did a little, I did a few triathlons when I was younger and then probably around 11 or 12 is when I got into lifting. I was just doing push-ups and pull-ups at home and then eventually convinced my parents to get a gym membership. And then probably the videos that you guys saw was about two years after that, where I'd been in the gym for about two years. And a lot of people don't believe me when I tell them this, but I literally doubled my body weight from 14 to 15. So from 130 pounds, about 60, 60 kilos all the way up to, you know, 120, 260 pounds, 120 Holy kilos shit. in 10 months. I mean, I, I made that happen. Like, I did that on purpose. I, I ate everything. I need a pound of cottage cheese every night before bed. I was eating Wendy's, you know, three or four, like, cheeseburgers a day. Like, I was eating everything. And I got really fat, but I did get really strong, too. I think if I hadn't done that, 
I never would have had the base that I have even now that that built that base for me. And uh, even now, I mean, I weigh I weigh about 122 kilos right now. And I, I was all, I was already 120 kilos 10 years ago. So I think that, <laughs> you know, like that, that base really helped me. And I've just yeah. con- like continuously kind of gotten leaner, recomposition the body, the body composition um, over those years. But people are like, oh, how do I get the 200, 200 pounds? It's like I was 200 pounds when I was 14. You know? like, that's what this is. Yasmin, you knowing the sport really well now and you having like a grounding in sports when you're doing your master's. What would you think would be the number one thing if a like a young guy or a young girl who's started doing CrossFit classes and they wanted to be the international weightlifter? What do you think you'd tell them? Well, um, to be honest, in, on our island, so here in Malta, we do have a few CrossFit gyms. And every single CrossFit gym has a representative from the Weightlifting Association that helps them with weightlifting. So... Actually, I said every single one, I would say almost every single one. And it is a certified coach by, uh, by the Malta Weightlifting Association. So I think the way they're doing it in Malta, in CrossFit gym, is great. Because no matter if you're a total beginner or someone who is uh, experienced in CrossFit, your weightlifting is always overlooked by a qualified weightlifting mm-hmm. coach. So I think that would be definitely the way to go in general in other gyms as well because um i always like to take the example of gymnastics for me personally because i did gymnastics for like seven years um but i never studied to be a coach in gymnastics so i would never coach gymnastics i i know the techniques quite well i've done it myself but i don't know how to i would never coach it because i never practiced coaching the sport so you could be great at it and you could you could look great doing it but you always need someone who's qualified in that area to to show you how to do things properly and I think I say this more passionately than ever because I have I still have so many mistakes that I picked up from my CrossFit years um, that I think if I if they were addressed immediately maybe I wouldn't have now five years on um so yeah habits you pick up in the very initial uh, phases of practicing your your sport um will kind of stick with you very very far along so if you can do it with a certified weightlifting coach from the beginning it would really help yeah. You know, that's really interesting you said about uh, Derek gets no criticism for criticizing everyone. That's so interesting. I never thought about he, There's no one who has a beef against him. No. You know? And it's like, well, that's so weird. I could never do that. No I mean, way. People would fucking fry me. They would eviscerate me. I already get fucking fried. No one is against Derek. No, no one. Like, we made the uh, three tiers of doping CrossFit. How CrossFit's get away doping, basically. And, like, loads of positive comments. Like, most of them are positive, right? But yeah. there are still, like, people being, like, 15 minutes and that one bit of evidence. And you're like, do you need evidence when you have, like, 8% body fat females snatching, like, 95 kilos and then doing sprints later in the day and then running half a marathon and then doing, like, a, a marathon or a, a roar and stuff. And you're like, do you, yeah. like... Do, do you need evidence like what? Yeah. Like it, it's Th- think about it like this: the game is recovering. The fucking sport is only recovering. Why? Because it's fucking easy. Yeah. I'm sorry. CrossFit is fucking easy. None of the movements are difficult for me. None of them. Maybe if I, you know, here's the problem: it's about work capacity, right? So, okay, yeah, a fucking handstand is handstand push-ups not actually difficult. To do thousands of them after running, yeah, that's difficult because it's just work capacity. It's not, you know, I know what's more difficult is playing basketball. Yeah. Playing football, playing soccer, playing rugby, playing, you know, actual sports where you have to make decisions and, and there's stimulus coming at you. Like, so in, in that, this is always, first off, this is going to sound like I'm roasting CrossFit, like I fucking hate it. This is what I, that's what I started weightlifting from. Okay. And I actually love CrossFit for that reason. But people need to understand it's not a game for I, I, not a game for real athletes. Like rugby, go play rugby. Go play, you know, that that shit's difficult. That's hard. 
And you take a lot of people who they find a formula. Yeah, we don't know what's coming at us with with CrossFit, but you kind yeah, of do. They tell you do. exactly what you're going to do, and then you go do it. It's, it's like, you know, weightlifting to a certain extent is like that. What's interesting about weightlifting is like it's such a finite and narrow point that we have to get to that there are so much mental – strain to get the most out of yourself it's it it's like beyond sport at that point it's very weird you know we know we're snatching we know we were cleaning jerking we know exactly the point in time in which we're going to do it but there's so many decisions beforehand that just make it into this crazy sport crossfit to me seems like okay Oh, you can do 100 push-ups? Let's see who can do 1,000 push-ups. Let's see who can do 2,000 push-ups. That's not making anything more difficult, right? It, it's The skill itself is not difficult. So, Yeah, I think definitely in the last 10 years or so, um, the amount of people who are like barely training or the amount of people who like you might know for a fact have only started training maybe a year or two ago and then suddenly you hear that this person is using whatever or like even worse they're after ordering SARMs of some sort that they have no real concept of what's happening with them uh like SARMs are something that we take the piss out of a lot and like particularly Garf takes the piss out of them a lot and so people kind of ask us questions about them thinking in some way we were trying to like promote them or open people up to them but no. i know when you were on the last time you talked about some of the dangers of SARMs, um but maybe just like to talk about that briefly just the kind of differences there well <laughs> there's a huge amount of differences and some of the differences aren't even so much in a safety sense as in a, a misrepresentation of the actual effects uh Let's see, where do I want to start that conversation? For, let, let's start with what a SARM is in a, in a very general metaphorical kind of sense. Um, people will use this very childlike mental image of lock and key for drug and receptor. Drug is like a key and it floats around and it eventually bumbles into a lock. And because it's the right key, it can unlock that lock and you get you know rainbows, unicorns and bigger squats. Okay, so lock and key, fine. Not a very good analogy, really, but for the sake of this childlike logic train, we can use it. All steroids, anabolic steroids, are patterned after the root androgen testosterone. And so it's kind of like when you go to the, the hardware store to get a key made, they have to find the template that most represents that key, then they cut the notches into it. So it's a master key and then the details to make it fit specifically. All... Testosterone-based drugs are strangely based after testosterone, that same master key. SARMs come along, and they're literally a skeleton key. They are not a steroid. They are not a sex hormone. They are not even patterned after the root testosterone. They just happen to be an amalgam of twisted fucking wire that happens to go into that lock and turn it. So it's a skeleton key. Because of that... They skip over an awful lot of what in the steroid world is kind of secondary effects. So in many cases, SARMs do build muscle and do, quote, work. And the very fact that they don't cause maybe certain aspects of masculinization are good for medicine because we don't want women and children and elderly you know, you don't need a, you know, 70 year old people fucking humping like rabbits and you know, gaming three times a day. And that, that's not really re requisite to the concept. However, even though those are side effects, those actually manifest as positive effects in sport. So you've got a drug that by its very design is literally inadequate to the tech. Yeah. Yeah. So in a best case scenario, even taking out side effects, unintended side effects, you know, androgen dis disruption and downregulation, all of which do actually happen. But if you just compare them on a note for note basis, the sheer refined nature makes it inadequate to the fucking task it's being applied to. Do, do you think it's something to do with the nature that a lot of these terms seem to come in 
droppers and oral forms, you know. No. As in, no, I mean, people love the people love to blame the, yeah. the 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 source. You know, that's oh, it's a it's a Chinese underground this or that or no, that that's that's absolutely super not the case. The case is the product is what the product is. That chemical structure behaves that way. Yeah. It's just that people lack the understanding of chemistry, biology, you know, quantum mechanics, whatever the fuck. They just don't understand what they're fucking buying. But he's in from like a barrier for entry. So from what I've seen with people, they're like, oh, it's a dropper. So it's, you know, it's, it's almost like a supplement. Yeah, it's it's not like, you know, hardcore. Yeah, that, that's, a really stu- that's a really stupid argument because, you you know, you could buy heroin in that same format. Yeah. Would it be would it, would it somehow be wholesome? <laughs> like it's, it's a really dumbass argument. But we know people who yeah. do steroids would have and do do SARMs. And I, I, I'm not sure what the disconnect is. I'm almost certain it's something to do with non-injectable i think it's something like that you know i think the way they're marketed here as well and that's something i'm not comfortable or qualified to weigh in on like why people are stupid (laughs) is so outside of my ability to weigh in on i all i can tell you the science they are drugs they work this way and they don't work nearly as well as people want to believe they do that that's pretty much the beginning middle and end of my song and fucking dance yeah doug they're more prolific with people we know take more SARMs than we know who people who take would take traditional steroids, you know, steroid-based, testosterone-based yeah. molecules. I certainly believe you, and, and I suspect the momentary non-illegality mm. yeah. uh, is probably some aspect of that, both in U- Europe and the U.S., but it doesn't change the fact that they're still drugs, yeah. and they're still a relatively poor choice for the job. Um, they're hyper-detectable. They're, they're actually more detectable in, in drug testing than the, than the actual steroids that they're replacing. There's really just no positive benefit other than access and legality. And really, if you're going to fucking cheat at sports, is that the thing you're going to fucking use as your pivot? Like, it's really, it's really goofy. So on that topic of the kind of intense cardio work, see – see a lot of your stuff where you're doing kind of hill sprints or stair sprints and you're doing the kind of uh, treadmill runs and we just don't see a lot of that with our strength athletes in particular so you know we see a lot of power lifters uh, weight lifters uh, we don't see them doing a lot of really intense physical cardiovascular work you know so for you're moving your body through space you know so uh, one how important does that play a role in your kind of interventions for the health side of stuff you know and and how do you see that kind of affecting that and then on the other side of things, how important do you think that is for those athletes' actual strength goals? So, like, how important does it play down the chain in terms of that kind of intense cardio work? I guess, again, it depends on the type of athlete. Now, if you're a power lifter or a strong man, I don't think sprinting has the right stimulus to fatigue ratio. I think that, that sprinting is very dynamic. You know, I use an overspeed treadmill, and so it's less uh, fatiguing on John than say, you know, just sprinting on a track. Uh, I don't think it would have much carryover for that specific type of athlete. Obviously a a football player would have a huge carryover benefit and they should absolutely be in zone five sprinting. Um, But mostly for strong men and power lifters, they're gonna wanna do a significant amount of zone two. I break that up into the 10 minute walks because I find that the the postprandial glycemia and the digestion is improved post meal and so I, I try and get at least 40 minutes a day of quote unquote cardio it's zone two. Uh, it's, it's a lactic. It's generally at a pace that you could probably talk at, uh, but not sing. Uh, you know, it's, it's a deliberate brisk, you know, arms are swinging, uh, has you know, numerous, numerous benefits for uh, even recovering from workouts, you know, frequency being more important than duration or quantity. And so I do think cardio is huge, but the type of cardio would really depend on the athlete. Strongmen and powerlifters, I do want them to be fast. Uh, I might initially uh, have them run some stairs because it's pretty low impact. It's all concentric as opposed to that decelerating force from sprinting. When you're running upstairs, you just don't get as much, uh, uh, you know, eccentric loading and, and muscle tissue breakdown and, and potential, uh, you know, injury risk. Uh, you have to watch out with powerlifters and strongmen uh, that what the velocity is like. You get too high a velocity and you're going to start rupturing muscles. They're just too big and strong uh, to move that fast. But in terms of speed strength, which is 
and very important for uh, powerlifters and strongmen. Then you want to train that, I think, with, uh, you know, you use your 70% intensity uh, loads using some bands or chains, moving that weight as quickly as possible, uh, maybe checking velocity with a meter. Uh, those kinds of things are great, but it's not cardio necessarily. So mainly the 10 minute walks four times a day, I get 40 minutes of cardio. You could also do that uh, walking with, um, you know, like Westside always loved to, uh, to pull, uh, pull sleds. That's another way that you could stay uh, in an alactic state and get uh, plenty of quote unquote cardiovascular fitness that is mainly concentric and provide a lot of recuperatory benefits from your training uh, and uh, and help your joints continue to get lots and lots of blood, which is the primary driver of healing for joints. Uh, that's uh, um, it's not it's an active therapy as opposed to passive, which I find to be much less beneficial.